So, hi everybody. Uh, welcome if this is your first time here to Brooklyn Public Philosophers. It's a, usually a monthly public philosophy speaker series where philosophers from around Brooklyn and New York City and the, the greater Brooklyn area uh, come to talk about their work. Um, so this is the penultimate meeting of the, of the series for this season. We've got one more next month. Um, there's an email list which you can sign up for if you want to find out more about the series. Anyway, I'm really glad that uh, Frank Kirkland from Hunter College and the CUNY Grad Center can join us. He's the author of The Problem of the Color Line, a bunch of other works on uh, philosophy and race. So uh, if you could join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you very much. Um, it's good to see a diversity in the audience, I mean in terms of generation. There are people here who Brown resonates very strongly. And then there's take a right across the board where Brown is just simply a whisper, right? Something that's been celebrated 50 years ago. Most the 50th anniversary was 10 years ago. So if you weren't around, you would have passed you by. Yet at the same time, uh, if there's any Supreme Court decision that had an impact on the issue of racial desegregation and the question of how one ought to understand the role of race in the educational institutions, right, Brown is it, and nothing has trumped it yet, even though, it's, from my point of view, it's worth trumping. Right. So, so Du Bois would even say that himself. In any case, let me go on. If I uh, slur or uh, let me know, uh, I'm trying to fight uh, the remnants of the cold. <clears throat> Brown versus the Board of Education is usually regarded as the most important Supreme Court decision regarding racial desegregation, <clears throat> educational opportunity, and so-called racial relations. So it covers a wide berth. Most people don't know that it's divided into two parts, Brown 1 and Brown 2. People just think of Brown decision in 1954, but there's a subsequent decision one year later in 1955. One can say, without putting it right now, the 54 decision basically declares Racially, danger of racial segregation in schools unconstitutional. In 1955, the Supreme Court gives the remedy. And that is, the remedy entails eliminating all single race schools. Okay. Most believe that Brown 1, 54, regarding danger of racial desegregation, racial segregation in the schools is unconstitutional. And then Brown 2 supplied the remedy to what was regarded as unconstitutional in Brown 1. But Brown 1's position has both its supporters and its critics. This divergence in opinion affects how Brown 1 is read and how Brown too is to be read as a consequence thereof. If you are a supporter of Brown 1, you usually praise Brown 1 for removing de jure racial segregation in the schools and for making it possible to engender equal opportunity for all people. Most people have this view that they think that's what Brown 1 uh, promulgated. But if you're a critic, you usually support Brown 1's intentions, but you challenge the soundness of its reasoning and oppose the philosophy, i.e., in this case, we liberalism, on which it stands. So, if you're a critic of Brown 1, you deem it that all black schools was wrong because all black schools necessarily triggered inferiority and low self-esteem in black children. And the question you need to ask is what has been deemed harmful on single race black schools and outcome of de jure or de facto segregation of races? 
you can basically call that the juror that is racial, dis racial segregation by design and de facto racial segregation by chance. Furthermore, critics assume dispute the assumption on which the court is entitled to mandate a remedy, usually race, to what was declared unconstitutional. So, you've heard this, for example, under by the current Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Roberts, who basically has made the argument that in the attempt to make use of race to remedy racial discrimination is a remedy that's wrong. Because you must make use of race in a way that the first step rendered unconstitutional. Okay? That's a very narrow reading when you think about it. The issues around Brown, too, validity, speaks to the unclear and hazy character of what is deemed unconstitutional in Brown 1. Some supporters, right, embrace Brown 1 or base the view that the Constitution is colorblind. Individuals are to be judged by their words, deeds, and characters, not by so called dubious qualities of race. The Constitution. I'm sorry. Can you flip to the slide that you are reading? Money go back? No, no. You're reading the next slide, aren't you? No, this is no, he's on this slide. No, no, he's on this slide. He's got the right slide. <laughs> okay. Um, same page? Okay. <laughs> Constitutes use to end danger of racial segregation in the schools and cannot use race to remedy past harm or its effects triggered by race sub segregation. Brown 2 is hence invalid. Again, that's Chief Justice John Roberts' position. <coughs> Some supporters of Brown 1 agree that a juror, racial segregation is unconstitutional, and agree that the remedy for the harm triggered by such segregation is constitutional, regardless of whether Inferior education is an outcome of any racial group. Race may or may not be legally relevant in the remedy. The remedy extends beyond educational institutions. The person who held that view, right, would be Thurgood Marshall. He promulgated this view. Third one, some supporters of Brown 1 agree to the remedy for the harm triggered by digital racial segregation, but only if the remedy supports better educational measures. Race may or may not be legally relevant in the remedy. The remedy is restricted to and within educational institutions. The person who owns that view would be, uh, would be uh, Justice Sonia Sotomayor. And then finally, fourth, some supporters of Brown 1 agree that both de jure and de facto racial segregation are unlawful in both educational and other public institutions. Remedy extends beyond educational institutions to both forms of racial segregation. That, for the most part, is the view of pretty much every fair-minded, like-minded people of the general public. Okay. Clearly, the gist an ambit of Brown 1 and Brown 2 cannot be squared away given the myriad interpretations of them stemming from the ambiguity of Brown 1. So, to the boys' views regarding Brown 1 and Brown 2 fall within this landscape, or do his views represent something else? My argument is going to be it represents something else. To understand both the reasoning in Brown 1 and the boys' views on black education, a single question has to be kept in mind. And this is the question right there. Does agreeing, is agreeing that racial segregation or racial segregation by design in schools is unconstitutional, does that mean that it signifies that all signifies Single way schools are unlawful 
unjust, right, unjustifiable, right? How does the court address that question? How does the boys address that question? Court addresses it legally and legally, answering yes, right? So if you have de jure racial segregation, that and you designate that, that segregation as unlawful and unconstitutional, that means that all single race schools are un un unconstitutional, are harmful, are illegal, right? Undescribed. And the court answered yes to that question. The boys, on the other hand, answers that question historically and comes up to answer no. Let's start with the legal reasoning in Brown 1 on the education of black children. If you look at the court's reasoning in Brown 1, they seem to, be, seem to take the following of a certain kind of syllogism. People know what a syllogism is. The non philosophers in the room, I know that philosophers in the room, right? The non philosophers in the room, right? You don't know or do know? It's a form of inference in order to justify a conclusion, right? So, what you end up having, right, is that usually most syllogisms start with a premise and a belief, argument or the inference is such that you start to see whether the inference or the premise can, follow, can provide you with support for the conclusion you want to reach, okay? So, this is the syllogism that I have up here that I seems to suggest how the court thought about this. First premise, 14th Amendment of the Constitution states, all citizens regardless of race should be granted equal protection under the law and due process. So they're constitutionally protected by law. Right? Second premise, legal de jure segregation is a breach of A. It's a violation of A. Ergo, conclusion, Legal de jure segregation, segregation is unconstitutional. That comes the rationale, right? However, the court's reasoning did not take this form. Pay attention to the second premise. The court cannot rely on the validity of the second premise without making recourse to experience. The validity of the second premise had to be A, in accord with past legal precedent, especially with Plessy versus Ferguson, and B, supported by empirical research. That's the only way the second premise could be sustained. Regarding the first one, the first point to that premise, right, Brown never denied the doctrine of separate, separate but equal. Right? Never denied it. That's the, even today, uh, segregation, uh, uh, separate, separation and equality still maintained. Still maintained. So Brown never undermined that. It declared, rather, that educational institutions were special. All right? because of their mission and task to shape the minds and the character of youth and to protect youth's intellectual and emotional growth from harm. Brown never legally dismantled and invalidated Plus, he is still on the books. Second point. The legal reasoning in Brown entailed a silent, fundamental, yet disparaging presumption. Namely, that blacks were incapacitated in esteem and in intellect due to enslavement and racial discrimination. In Brown 1, that presumption was made viable by virtue of the court's appeal to a body of empirical, empirical psychological research affirming, one, the, the damaging emotional effects of racial segregation and isolation, and two, purporting to show that black school children have low self-esteem as a result of their racial isolation in racially segregated schools. That by the work you may know is what 
did was what made Clarks, Kenneth Clark and Mamie, right, give them prominence. Again, for those who have some history or age, like me, right, this would be up. For those who don't, I would advise you to go to your teachers and ask them to talk to you about Kenneth and Mamie Clark. They are prominent uh, public intellectuals. They both passed away, but uh, uh, he kind of thought, uh, you're here, Anthony. He and taught at City? Yes, so it's in college. He taught at City College. Mm -hmm. right about 10 years ago. Yeah. Even on a hypothesis that two racially segregated schools, one black and one white, with educational identical resources and services were in play, only black children would be debilitated by this racial isolation. Never white children. Never white took. So the presumption becomes what is going on with that second premise? Right? Because if you condemn racially segregated schools, one has negative impact on a certain group, but not on another. Hence, in Brown, when you rule out racial segregation by design in the schools, that means that you outlaw all or predominantly single race educational institutions because they are harmful to black children in generating sentiments of inferiority and ultimately are impractical since they were not and would not be earmarked public funds. <coughs> questions so far? I'll take yeah. questions. Yeah. So, I'm glad you asked. Thank you, Dr. Kirkland. Um, I just want to be clear because I'm not. So maybe you can help me out. Um, a little slow. Brown one. No, you're not slow. Okay. All right, all right. Well, look, brown one. Uh, does that mean the jury segregation? You know, being that by law, you know, they're they're over they're overruling that. No, and brown one just simply declared that de jure racial segregation was unconstitutional. unconstitutional. So the issue is, is that the existence of Single race schools, right, were regarded as unconstitutional. What then would be the remedy? One year later, the remedy was with quote unquote all deliberate speed, right, you were to eliminate them. But the elimination were to black schools, not to single race white schools. Now, the issue you have to deal with is the fact that the countermand strategy of what was going on prior to Brown. Was that being done by a lawyer from Howard, by the name Charles Hampton Houston, who took classic, the separate but equal clause? He did a very strategic move. He demanded that blacks enter schools, right? And that if the schools had stopped them from entering, he said it was a responsibility of the state to create an equal one. No state legislature was going to make two sources of revenue through schools of that type. That's what forced integration, right? Now, what would be interesting would be taking Du Bois' view and taking Charles Hamilton's uh, Hamilton view and see where they diverge for us that last Sunday. But Charles Hamilton Houston is the mentor to Thurgood Marshall, right? And Thurgood Marshall implemented that strategy in Brown. But you also define uh, Brown 2 from a just maybe Brown 2 is that which says what we declare as unconstitutional constitutional has a harm. We must provide remediation for that harm. To start the remediation process, we must eliminate all black schools. Is that where de facto comes in by custom? De facto, well, let's put it this way. When you say racial segregation by design, you're basically saying that you have decided to segregate on the, according to a certain plan by design. So it's intentional. You're going to have racial segregation by chance. There's nothing that the court can do if it's racial segregation by chance. But you have designated 
that such schools be isolated by virtue of design of your social system, then that would be unconstitutional. I mean, we have many de facto segregated schools in America. Well, this is something that could be saved for later insofar as you can ask that question about what the impact of Brown has been now. So, Brown won their claim that ruling out the jury racial segregation in the school was right because such segregation directly violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, even if disavowing the protection did not precipitate sentiments of inferiority among black children in civil race and gay society. That's to say, you could argue there could be schools in which those students are in schools due to an outcome of segregation. But that doesn't mean that the schools in which those schools are separated from, from other white students, produce educationally educa harmed students. There's no argument in that. That breaks up. Right? But the belief by the court Right, took, the court took that belief and kept it. <laughs> the horse is beautiful. As far as I can see, the boys never repudiated Brown Moon in wholesale fashion or on this point. His critique thereof appears rather suggestive than direct. Still, critics of Brown, I would probably say black critics of Brown, are quite reliant on Du Bois' thesis that there was a need for racially segregated schools for black children and that schools did not necessarily breed low self-esteem among black children. So, there's a lot of folk who basically adopt the voice's position, right? There's a need for ways to segregate schools. But one has to be very, very careful what, Brown, what the voice meant by that. That review was promulgated throughout the voice's lifetime when he addressed the matter of education of black youth. And his thesis was also reliant on social science as well, but not psychology. But that was reliant, reliant on history. So, critics of Brown 1 claim that the court's reliance on research concerning the deteriorating impact of low self-esteem among black children in all black schools was both wrong on social science, as the boys would say, and unnecessary to their argument that racially segregated schools violated the Equal Protection Law clause of the 14th Amendment. Brown was the board to say this. Okay. Still, we should be mindful that Boyce's thesis was a conditional one, not categorical. That's a mistake most supporters of the boys tend to make. They fail to see that he Congress that you on the, on the basis that a certain condition must be met. Right? It doesn't say straight away that you need all black schools. Ideally, what well, black youth at the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels needed in his eyes was quality education, period. He's speaking to providing his own, his own education, which was taught not. Right? He wasn't holding back on this, <coughs> regardless of whether it was carried out in segregated schools or integrated schools. But as long as, quote, the sort of publication, public education <coughs> creating the intelligent base of democracy was lacking in America, end of quote, the boys argued for the necessity of single race schools for black children. I repeat this that quote again. As long as the sort of public education creating the intelligent basis of democracy was lacking 
That's the condition. Was lacking the broad party for the necessity of single race homes for black children. That quote is taken from his essay, Does the Negro Need Separate Schools? And that was published in the Journal of Negro Education in 1935, nearly 20 years prior to Brown. Although Du Bois was not explicit, the sort of public, public education he had in mind operates on two different tracks, each with its own aim. One track, and even though I don't make explicit the philosophy behind all this, there is a philosophy going on here. He had, what he has in mind is another story, but there is, within the history of philosophy, someone who does like I'll make that known later on. <clears throat> one track guides a black child to being a citizen, instilling in her the character traits needed to endorse freely the good of her nation as her own, to regard herself freely and fully as part of the national unity. Here, the public school serves a political, in this case, democratic purpose, and ideally would be integrated In short, this track leads to producing a citizen who enters the political world already formed. But as already formed, a citizen brings with her beliefs, aspirations, and self-conceptions that are the result of long and complex learning processes, processes undergone in her formative years. <laughs> It is this other educational track, so to speak, that Du Bois takes as the focus of his thesis. Setting down his position regarding the importance of separate schools for black children, a position from which he never wavered. Du Bois' thesis is attending to the striving for esteem in schools, wherein the esteem driven for can be had only comparatively that is only in relation to the esteem bestowed on one by others, and wherein the esteem sought can be measured only through the eyes and opinions of others. Per se, nothing is wrong with this. But on line with segregation, the bestowal of esteem on black children would entail a malignant propensity to fuel with passionate intensity the incentive, the incentive for forms of inequality, even with su political support, since the esteem sought in relation to others would be measured by those taking themselves as superior or indifferent to others. This is what you find in the classroom, where the person who is to bestow esteem on children on the basis of their attempting to strive is a teacher. Now imagine black children being in a school where the teacher supported by segregation, is called upon to make evaluations on students. And a good case in point about that phenomenon, you already have seen. And that person is in the form of Loretta Lynch. If you go look at her biography, as a high school student, she was valedictorian of her high school in South Carolina. Yet, the school, and that was in 19, what, 67? It was way past this, in 67, where the school decided that she had to share the valedictorianship because it would be improper for a black child as valedictorian to come on the stage on her own. So she was denied that. And that's the kind of phenomenon that the boys is trying to speak to and address. <clears throat> Outside of single race schools, most black children at the time would, the boys states, receive an education, quote, worse than pitiable, or would be, quote, crucified rather than educated, end quote. The estimations they received 
therefore achievements or competencies would not be deemed valuable or worthy in some respects, <clears throat> would not be defined in relation to the worthiness according to others, and would not be worthy in the eyes and judgments of others. So oh, the philosopher, by the way, uh, that I'm following here, right, is Rousseau as a meal. It's Rousseau meal. Because he's concerned about how you educate children, right, wherein estimations about children affect the manner in which they become citizens in a state. And so the issue is, is that it doesn't just simply make sense to educate students in a way such that they become proper citizens, it becomes important that they educate them in such a way that they appreciate striving for excellence and competence and be evaluated in a way in which nothing that they seek to achieve is stifled. Du Bois himself even makes, makes recourse a quote from himself from time to time. <clears throat> In short, schools outside of single race ones would deny or mitigate a black child's esteem by not relying on actual matters as the basis for deserving at least commensurate esteem from others. Separate schools for black children would have the opposite and hence the beneficial result. <clears throat> The voice is also critical, excuse me, <clears throat> the voice is also critical of the NAACP in this essay, <clears throat> for it stands against separate single race schools for black children. NAACP was trying to take on the Charles Hammond Houston tragedy of Thurgood Marshall. That's why I said it would be interesting to do a piece of the boys in that track. He claims that it stands would lead to legal decisions unable to distinguish. And then the NAACP be unable to distinguish blatant and infinite racial segregation against Negro education from conditionally necessary separate black schools safeguarding the esteem of black children from such segregation. The question that I asked, how prescient was the voice? Twenty years later, in 1955, the board delivered a speech entitled, quote, 200 years of segregation, end quote, in which he broadly laid out a history of public education as racially segregated by brief and deep and frequent periods of integration. <clears throat> Although he lightly touches on the history of public educational track discussed in the early essay in 1935, the boy's emphasis in this speech is the history of the public schools in their numerous attempts to serve a democratic purpose in the context of racial segregation. <clears throat> I believe this is why in this essay, he holds out hope for Negro education in the incremental advance of the black vote, securing gradual increase in the curbing of segregation by race in public schools, rather than safeguarding the esteem of black children in Negro schools from it. <clears throat> Finally, the boys' 1957 article, What is the Meaning of All Deliberate Speed? That phrase, all deliberate speed was mentioned, was used, in order to establish the need for an immediate remedy to what was declared unconstitutional. Okay? Again, that essay is broadly a history, but a history not with the phrase's meaning, but the times and context in which the phrase was used. The phrase signifies the governmental promise to remedy the harms black people have undergone from state-approved racial segregation. And for black people, the history refers to the repetition of the promise, rather to the implementation of the remedy. <clears throat> so what he's trying to show you is that that phrase 
one of them would be a rhetorical. It was not the first time it was used. It's been used previously with no effect. The Boyce interprets Brown II to form within the history of repeated promises to legislate against racial segregation since, according to the Boyce, the promises to legislate against their offense and to enforce such legislation have been neutralized by the customs and sentiments of segregation perpetrators. In effect, outlawing age-old racial segregation in the schools because such, a, such segregation directly violated the equal protection laws of the 14th Amendment and harm black youth was insufficient for generating the political and social will necessary to end legally racial segregation in the school. So, ground two was needed, promised, and eventually ignored. If Brown 1 were correct, Brown 2 would in fact be saying, given Du Bois' article, black, that black children would have to continue experiencing substandard education and sentiments of inferiority until an avenue could be fashioned that would eliminate these problems without jeopardizing, jeopardizing white students. So 60 years later, it's still a way to remedy. Conclusion. I hope this is what you take from what I've laid out. First, Brown 1 compels you to attend to the meaning of racial equality and equal educational opportunity. Through the boys, it challenges us to come to grips with the value of striving and esteem to our identities in a pluralistic society. Right? That emphasis is there. And indeed, my argument would be any and every child in the school, that should be your main concern. Bound one will not be read as A, granting legal authority to bring about racial integration. It should be read as merely B, prohibiting compulsory racial segregation in public schools. The boys can be taken as being critical of Brown 1, but never in repudiating it, since he read it in terms of 2B, not 2A. The boys' thesis does not commend him to the view that single race schools would be intentionally and freely created and embraced. It does commend him to that view only if other schools violate rights and single race schools do not. That's the condition. The boys vehemently disagree with the thesis that black children develop sentiments of inferiority in all black schools. Finally, the boys neither provided a comprehensive account nor a detailed analysis of the issues surrounding sentiments of inferiority in black children in terms of striving and esteem. Rather, he gave an ample and generous description of it in a number of his writings, a description of the experience of those exposed to the estimation of others when engaged in the quest for esteem. Human beings have this quest from a young age, which involves an unlimitable comparison with love. Can't avoid it. It is not just that the estimation can be inegalitarian, but that it can be inflamed and demoralizing as well, to which I gave present analysis in this presentation. Finally, Du Bois knew that fostering an inegalitarian form of the sentiment in black children, that is educating black children to A, conceive of themselves as equal in moral standing to all others, and B, while seeking excellent and concomitant esteem that comes in teaching <coughs> and itself. That's what public schools should be doing. Right? To come during his long life from a black school without succumbing 
to the juror racial variation. That, thank you very much. <laughs>